we're going to have to get started because I brought a bunch of slides and uh, as people filter in, we'll just let them take a seat. What I'm going to do, um, you know, th they handed out a, uh, a bunch of tips for how to uh, interact or manage someone with dementia. Uh, I didn't write these. These came from the clinical experience of the nurses and administrators over at Morningside Manor. Now, we work in Morningside Manor, and that's one of the sites that we've been doing uh, some of our research. What I want to do instead is uh, give you really a model for understanding how problem behavior develops in dementia. And then with that model, you can, first of all, go over uh, these suggestions and see how it fits these particular instances. And secondly, when you're faced with new situations that maybe these people haven't, uh, haven't seen before, you'll be able to come up with your own uh, interventions and strategies. And I'll give you some examples of what the nurses at Morningside have been able to do uh, thinking this way. Uh, if I could have the slides. So what I want to point out, these are basically the three points of the talk. First of all, that uh, what dementia is, is a syndrome of global cognitive deficits in a clear sensorium. So that demented people have difficulties in a lot of areas, not just memory, not just language, not just the way they draw or get dressed, but in many different areas at once. The specific diseases that cause their dementia may impair some areas and leave other areas alone. Uh, Alzheimer's disease in particular always causes memory loss, but that doesn't mean that memory loss is a sign of dementia per se or an essential feature of dementia. Other diseases can cause dementia with no memory loss at all. The last point is that what all of the different diseases that cause dementia have in common is a syndrome of what's, uh, what we think of as executive discontrol. Executive functions are, are a higher group of cognitive functions that basically help you sequence your behavior, plan it, organize it, and execute it. And you may lose the ability to do that even if you retain the ability to do each of the individual pieces of behavior. So what you see clinically is that patients um, seem to be able to do things, but don't in fact get them done. I'll go to the next slide. So let's take uh, the, the idea that dementia is a syndrome, not a disease like Alzheimer's disease, but a syndrome. Here's another syndrome, heart failure. What a syndrome is, is a group of signs and symptoms that come together. That when you have one of these signs and symptoms, the other ones usually follow and you can recognize it because they're all there together in different patients with different diseases and different disorders. Dementia is a syndrome of two or more cognitive deficits in a clear sensorium. The sensorium has to be clear. They have to be awake and alert and talking to you but everything they say doesn't make sense. It doesn't, you know, they're not doing things that uh, they should be doing, but they're awake and alert and trying. This makes them different from people with delirium, which can give you exactly the same cognitive deficits, but produces a change in sensorium so that those people are hard to arouse or hard to keep engaged in your conversation. You're constantly having to, to go in there and, and shake them and say, no, I'm talking to you. A demented patient looks you in the eye and everything they say is wrong. Now, a lot of people think of dementia like this as memory loss. And like I said, that's not necessarily true. We can think of memory loss as being, uh, you know, a lot of people have a little bit of memory loss, but if you get this much memory loss, there's something wrong and you become demented. Okay? But that's not necessarily true. Let's go back to heart failure. You might think of heart failure in the same way as a whole lot of shortness of breath. But automatically you start to see it doesn't make sense. That there are lots of reasons why you could be very, very short of breath and you wouldn't have heart failure. Because the, what makes a syndrome a syndrome is not how strong any one symptom is, but what group of symptoms you have. So you can have dementia, have many cognitive deficits in a clear sensorium, but not any one of them be particularly bad and no memory loss at all. Or you could have horrible memory loss, but everything else be working right and you wouldn't be demented. Now, another neat thing about syndromes is that lots of different diseases can cause the same syndrome. So that you could have dementia with every symptom of Alzheimer's disease, but it could be caused by three or four different diseases. 
So in the case of syndrome, the things that we're usually worried about are Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common cause of dementia, but also things like multiple infarcts, normal pressure, hydrocephalus, Parkinson's disease, uh, Pick's disease, major depression. These are all other causes of the dementia syndrome. And that syndrome can look very much like Alzheimer's disease. This is how the DSM-3, which psychiatrists use to uh, make diagnoses, this is how it approaches dementia. And I, what I want to show you is that thinking about dementia as a syndrome is something that may or may not be part of how people approach, I mean officially approach uh, diagnosing dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So the DSM-3 starts out with the fact that you've got to have memory loss, you see. I think it, it makes a mistake there. What it's doing is confusing the disease, Alzheimer's disease, with the syndrome of dementia. Because it's saying you have to have memory loss. What I'm saying is that you have to have global cognitive deficits. Memory may or may not be one of them. But if you have Alzheimer's disease, you have to have memory loss. This is an alternative uh, way of classifying dementia which is produced by the, the National Institutes of Neurologic Conditions, uh, Communicative Disorders and Stroke, the NINCDS. This is a, a better way of thinking about dementia. It says that first you have to have the syndrome dementia, and then if you have the syndrome of dementia, which is deficits in two or more areas confirmed by exam, plus no disturbance of consciousness, then it's Alzheimer's disease if you have these other things. You have to have memory loss to have Alzheimer's disease, but you don't need it to have dementia. Okay. And this is another, this is an algorithm that we use to establish a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. What we start out with is, do they have global cognitive deficits in a clear sensorium? If they have that, are some of those deficits cortical? We'll get back to that later. If they have that, is memory loss one of the deficits that they have? If they have that, is their story okay? The story that a patient gives you when they're demented depends on the disease, not the syndrome. You can diagnose somebody as being demented just by sitting in a room and talking to them five minutes because you can establish that they have these signs and symptoms. But the natural history of their dementia what age it started, how long it's lasted, is it getting worse, is it staying the same, does it fluctuate, do they get better, or things like that. Natural history describes diseases, not syndromes. So that what we're doing by finding if the story sounds good is establishing that they have Alzheimer's disease, having already said that they're demented. And if the story is good, finally we look at whether or not they have other medical risk factors that could cause the competing diagnoses, like strokes or do they have evidence of depression or do they have Parkinson's disease, things like that. What you'll find is that some people with those other diseases still have Alzheimer's disease because the story is the story of Alzheimer's disease and they have dementia. Other people who have those stroke risk factors will have completely different stories and their dementia is something else. Okay. Now I think if you get away from memory, if you, if you uh, get away from that way of looking at dementia, then you start to find that there are a group of cognitive deficits that can explain how problem behavior develops in all dementias, regardless of the disease. And these are the executive functions. Executive functions are the cognitive processes that orchestrate simple bits and pieces of behavior into complex goal-directed chains. Okay, so that you can lose the ability to organize your behavior but retain the ability to do each individual piece, each individual step. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, you also lose a lot of the steps, okay? But you can be just as demented and have a different diagnosis and lose only the ability to organize the behavior. Uh, these functions uh, are related to the frontal lobes, okay? Alzheimer's disease attacks the frontal lobes in about the same frequency and severity that it attacks the memory centers, which are in the temporal lobes. So that because we recognize cases based on memory loss, we've concentrated on the temporal lobes and haven't really paid much attention to the frontal lobes. Other diseases hit the frontal lobes only, okay? There's a uh, famous case history, I'll give you an example of this, of a woman who had a frontal lobe brain tumor. This woman could cook scrambled eggs, could cook toast and could cook bacon 
but she can't cook breakfast. Because breakfast is the organization of all of the individual steps of each of those individual acts. You know, if you think about it, when you make breakfast, you gotta crack open the eggs, turn on the burner, put the bacon on, scramble the eggs, take the bacon and turn it over, add the salt and pepper, take the bacon off, put the eggs on the burner, put the bread in the toaster, take the bacon, I mean, take the eggs off, and then the po toast pops up and you have breakfast. If you do it in any different order, you don't get breakfast, you get a mess. What happens is that many of the behaviors that are important for people's welfare in the community, getting dressed, going to work, cooking for themselves, shopping, doing the bills, they're all complex goal-directed behaviors that are vulnerable to these uh, functions. So uh, this slide just shows you that the things we're usually used to worrying about in dementia, attention, memory, language, constructions, all of that, that is below the executive functions. The executive functions are things you never get back in your cognitive screening evaluations or your neuropsychologist report. They don't tell you about their anticipation of the future from a certain cue or their ability to select goals or the sequencing that they uh, employ in order to get their goals done. Nobody tests for this, nobody thinks about this, but this is crucial to getting along in, in life. So this is an example of what, you, what the executive functions do. If you have a plan uh, or a goal in mind, you have to come up with a plan. And your plan might involve selecting these three steps of all the possible steps that you know how to do to get from here to there. You have to put them in the right order. As you progress towards your goal at each step, you have to, first of all, uh, execute the step. And then you have to monitor your progress towards the goal. Did I do it right? If I'm gonna get dressed, I have to do a, f a button. There are five buttons to do. Did I do this button correctly? Maybe I missed, maybe I didn't do it right, maybe I left it open, maybe I missed a button. But assuming I got it right, then I have to decide that I still wanna get dressed, there's still another button, I do the next button. Then I have to monitor whether I did that one right. Then I have to decide, do I still wanna get dressed? Is there another button? You keep like that till you get it done. A lot of Alzheimer's patients can't get dressed, but what's wrong is not that they've forgotten how to do the buttons or that they forgot to do the next button. It's that their ability to organize that behavior and sustain it over several steps has fallen apart. They can do one button. If they can do one button, they can do any button. But they fail to do the string of buttons that it takes to get dressed. So this translates into the real world. You see this happening all the time in Alzheimer's patients. You have to remind them to do the next step. You have to prompt them, you have to guide them, you have to give them the cues. And if you do that, they may be able to execute the next step correctly, showing you that they always had the capacity to do the next step. What is wrong is the ability to sustain that act over several sequences. There's another example cooking. So it says, oh wait, Corey, add the cereal first and then the milk. You see? We see this a lot. People, little, um, little old ladies living alone at home. She quits cooking. She quits shopping. And after a while, she develops what a geriatrician might call the tea and toast syndrome, where she cooks nothing more complicated than instant, instant tea or popping bread in the, uh, in the toaster. Those cooking scrambled eggs is far too complicated. She can't sustain that anymore. Now, there are two kinds of memory that neuropsychologists talk about. There's declarative memory, which is names, dates, facts, okay? This type of memory is stored in the temporal lobes in the cortex. Alzheimer's disease is a cortical disease. It destroys the temporal lobes and eliminates this kind of memory. They forget all of those names, dates, facts, who's who, places, where they are, what they're doing there. That sort of memory is erased in Alzheimer's disease. But procedural memory, how to do something, is subcortical. And so it's not destroyed by Alzheimer's disease. And they remember how to do things, even though they can't name how you would do it. An Alzheimer's patient can drive a car because of their habits, having driven a car for years. If you put them in a car, they will drive but they can't name the pieces of a car. They have no idea where they're going. They have no idea where they want to be. They can't read street signs. They don't know left from right, right? But they can still drive a car. 
Plumbers can still fix sinks. Carpenters still try to fix squeaky doors in nursing homes. Doctors get up in the morning and make rounds in the nursing homes. People, much of the behavior that's coming out of patients in Alzheimer's disease is being triggered by their habits. And that gives you an idea to understand how it's developing and to find strategies to make it into the sort of behavior that you want to see happening. A question on that. Sure. I have a patient that um, has Alzheimer's and his wife, every time to bring him in on IGES, his mouth is just gross. She says, I cannot get him to brush his teeth or take a bath. Mm -hmm. So what does she have to do if the skills are there? Um, not tell him, but show him? Yeah, exactly. We're going we're gonna to get into some of that stuff. But, but basically, uh, habits act differently than the knowledge of names, dates, and facts. Habits are triggered by cues, by seeing the object, right? So that if you have somebody who doesn't brush his teeth, you want to show him the bathroom where the toothbrush is rather than find him in the living room and say, it's been a while since you brushed your teeth. They won't respond to language cues like that. But if you take them to the bathroom and show the objects, if the objects are out there, they'll just pick up the objects and use them. That can work for you, but it can also work against you. We had a guy who uh, would get up in the middle of the night to urinate, right? So he walks into the bathroom. The bathroom is a rich environment that is full of cues that directed his behavior for years. For years, he went into that bathroom in the dark on his way to work. So the stimulus of the bathroom in the dark elicited his usual morning routine and he starts shaving, showering, and getting dressed for work. It doesn't matter that he's been retired for 12 years, that he was on his way to go to the bathroom, that it's three in the morning and he has no job. His conception of those dates, facts, you know, that sort of understanding is erased. He's operating purely out of the fact that he's in the bathroom in the dark, you see? So his wife has to bring him back to bed every night every night. He gets up to go back to the bathroom again a little bit later, he starts showering, shaving, and getting dressed for work over and over and over. You see? So what we did was have the family lock the bathroom door at night and get him a bedside commode. Okay? A bedside commode is a stimulus he's never seen before, so he has no habits what to do with it. Alzheimer's disease removes cortical knowledge and skills and understanding, but it leaves the subcortical structures in intact. So you can teach a new habit to an Alzheimer's patient even though he won't remember that you taught him it. You see, he won't have the memory of the days and visits that you taught him how to do something, but in the end, if you show him the object, he'll pick it up and use it. So that they were able to teach him the habit, get on the toilet, go back to bed, get on the toilet, go back to bed, get on the toilet, go back to bed. So after a couple of months of that, he would wake up in the middle of the night, get on the toilet, go back to bed. The behavior is gone. He's no longer getting into the bathroom, which is an environment that pulls out the problem behaviors that the caregiver sees as a problem. On the other hand, another caregiver might have a patient who never goes to the bathroom and she can't get him to take baths. So she has to do the opposite. She has to use the environment to bring that behavior out of him. You see? Anyway, so how do habits work? You have to think about habits work differently than other kinds of knowledge, other kinds of memory. If you, if you want to think about that, think about the way people are taught. If you're taught a knowledge sort of thing, memory dates, whatever, like in history books, right? You're, you're taught through visual and language and people just tell you and you read a book and you memorize it. But if you want to learn a habit, habits are taught by daily repetition. Whatever you do daily over and over and over becomes a habit. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to try. You just do it. If you do it, it will go in there and become a habit. That's how the army trains people. Just don't think about it, do it over and over and over until finally you're able to put a gun together in your sleep from all of the pieces without even thinking about it. That's how you teach a habit. That's different than the way you would teach, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean in 1492. So um, habits are triggered by stimuli to the extent because whatever you're doing was paired with a particular object over a long time. So whatever whatever resembles that original stimulus will bring out the habit. And in this example, it's a handshake. This person, another thing about habits is that they happen before you even think about them. They just happen because they're coming up from deep down in the brain where you don't really have conscious awareness of it. It just pops up like that. 
So this person got into trouble because he misinterpreted this stimulus as a handshake. And before he knew what he was doing, before he even thought about the consequences, he did it. That's how a habit works. Okay. So what we're saying is that in an Alzheimer's patient, or in a normal patient, the environment, which can be physical in the sense of you know, doorknobs, light switches, things like that, but it can also be social in the sense of a handshake. These cues elicit from your subcortical brain structures a, your repertoire, whatever you know how to do habitually. Bop. Those are the five things you know to do in this situation. And then your executive functions decide, given the higher your goals, your motives, the situation, social constraints, you decide what's the most appropriate way to behave and begin to behave appropriately. And whatever's not appropriate, you inhibit, you get rid of it. What we're saying is happening in Alzheimer's is that this is destroyed. So that now people are environmentally dependent, that they do whatever the environment suggests. Okay. So I can give you some, some more examples. A uh, little old lady walks by her closet on the way to the bathroom. The closet is a familiar cue that is in tune with her past habits. The closet is full of sweaters. Each individual sweater says, put me on, right? So she puts a sweater on, but she's still in front of a closet. It's still there, it's still full of sweaters. So she puts another one on, but she's still in front of a closet. It's still there, it's still full of sweaters. So she puts another one on, but she's still in front of a closet. It's still there. There's nothing up there saying, we don't need these sweaters. It's not, you know, it's the middle of July. I've got three of them on already. There's nothing up there doing that anymore. They're purely driven by those environmental cues, right? You're in the nursing home. Um, somebody walks up and turns off the lights because that's what you do with a light switch. So you get up there and you turn them back on. Then another person walks by and they turn them off. So you get up and you turn it back on. But somebody else walks by and they turn it off. It's a familiar cue to all these people. They don't want to be in the dark. They don't want to be in the light. They have no goals. They have no perception of where they want to be. They're simply responding to the fact that this is a familiar cue. Our nursing home had that problem and got rid of it by putting Christmas cards over the, uh, over the light switches. You can think of wandering this way. People wander because of doorknobs. They're not going anywhere. But the doorknob is a familiar cue, intimately related to your past experience and your habits. It elicits door opening behavior. As Soon as they open that door, they're in a hallway where people are walking along. They imitate that behavior. Those people are going to the front door. They know where they're going. The Alzheimer's patient just follows along, imitating the behavior that it's, they see going on around them. So they get to the front door. The front door goes psh, like that. So they walk right through. There's a bus. Psh, steps. So they climb up the steps. Next thing you know, they call you up from downtown at the bus station and say, you know, we've got your patient here. They weren't going downtown. They couldn't never have sustained that sort of goal-directed behavior through several steps. What they did was just drift along one cue to the other and they ended up downtown. So the other implication of this is that if you don't have a habit to do something, you won't do it when you become demented. People with Alzheimer's disease do what they used to do, what they used to inhibit but now can't inhibit it anymore. So you won't have habits to do things you've never done before. Think of a nursing home. Again, a nursing home is an unfamiliar environment. Most people have never been in one. Most housewives have never seen one. So if you take a housewife with Alzheimer's disease and put them into the nursing home, they just sit. They're not generating their own behavior. They have no goals anymore. Nobody's up there telling them what to do or what to do with themselves or where to go. So they just sit because it's an unfamiliar environment. It doesn't attack their habits. It doesn't tell their habits what to do. So they just sit all day long. Okay, you put a doctor in an Alzheimer's patient, I mean an, all, uh, an Alzheimer's unit, he'll make rounds in the morning because it's a familiar environment to him. It tells his habits to do lots of things. Our uh, Alzheimer's unit has a gate to prevent wandering. There's a border guard down there who stands at the gate and checks your ID, right? A lot of uh, our nurse's desk is about this high, it's about this big here. It reminds older people of making bank deposits because their birth cohort used to give the money over at a teller. Our cohort doesn't have that. When we become demented, we won't walk up to the nurse's desk and go, where'd I put that deposit, ma'am? Right? 
In our nursing home, not only do people frequently come up over and over and over and ask where they put their money, but once they start doing that, somebody gets in line behind them, and then somebody gets in line behind that. You see? Because they're all responding to this, this uh, ever-shifting set of cues. It's driving them in one direction or the other or the other. On the other hand, if you, you develop habits from your past experience, you can predict what people will do in, an, in a particular environment by thinking about what they used to do in similar settings. So this person, even though it's socially inappropriate, has a habit built up years ago to pop the balloons of people walking around. And he's engaging that behavior now that it's disinhibited from his control. This is a real patient. Um, this gentleman has Alzheimer's disease. He's wearing glasses, so you know that he has habits for what to do with glasses. The doctor here put two pairs of glasses on the table, picked one up and put them on. He picks his glasses up and puts it on too because he has a habit for what to do with glasses. The fact that he's already wearing glasses, he can't, he can't inhibit the behavior for that reason. Okay? When I interview someone with Alzheimer's disease, I can take out my glasses and say, what are these called? And he'll pick them up and put them in his pocket if he wore glasses before. He won't answer my question. The language centers are destroyed in Alzheimer's disease, but the habits are there. They know what to do with glasses. They can't tell you what they're called. So uh, we created a, an instrument to start looking at some of these executive functions at the bedside. And this is uh, uh, its correlation, the geriatric executive interview, with the uh, nursing home behavior problem scale in Morningside Manor. And uh, basically, as the scale gets worse, behavior problems start to pop out. Okay? The correlation between these two was 0.8. This is the frequency of each one of these behaviors in people who are normal on the test in Morningside Manor versus people who are abnormal. Some people are normal in Morningside Manor. They broke a hip or they're, you know, they're there to recover from an accident or a slip or something. Not very many, though. And you can see that almost all of the problem behaviors on this scale are far more frequent in people with executive deficits than people in the same environment who don't have executive deficits. Uh, this, we divided Morningside Manor into four levels of care based on the services. You know, if, if, if uh, most of your self-care is a complex string of goal-directed behavior, then when you get executive deficits, it'll fall apart. You won't be able to take care of yourself. Someone will have to step in and take care of you for them. Okay? So we took Morningside Manor and broke it into four levels of care based not on people's diagnoses or physical problems, but on the services they actually receive. Okay? This is uh, apartments where ostensibly no, nobody has any supervision. This is residential care, which is the equivalent of a Holiday Inn, right? When you stay at the Holiday Inn, you don't make the bed in the morning, somebody does. You don't do your laundry, somebody does. You don't cook the meals, somebody does, okay? But you're not in a nursing care setting. This is a nursing home and this is an Alzheimer's unit. Okay, no normal on the test is 15, okay? Nobody in the apartments is above 20, and nobody in the Alzheimer's unit, or very, just a couple there, were above 30. Um, now, one of the things I want to point out, these were statistically different, even though there's not very many people in this slide, but uh, these two groups overlap a lot in how executively impaired they are. Anybody who's worked in a retirement community will tell you that. They, they bring people in when they're relatively well off, and they get demented living in that same apartment. They don't move them because they don't develop behavior problems. When they get behavior problems, then they have to move them out, take them to the nursing home. What this is saying is that they're just as cognitively impaired as the people living in the nursing home. The difference is the environment. This environment is a Holiday Inn. It's familiar. It tells you what to do, and what it tells you to do are normal things, right? Because you've been in Holiday Inns before, and they look residential. They look like your house. They, they have, uh, you know, the sinks are the same, the bathrooms are the same, the furniture is the same. And those cues are telling those people how to behave. And the way that they behave, given those cues, is a normal way. So we say they behave better than somebody with the exact same cognitive deficit in a different, more institutional, less uh, friendly environment. 
And that's what we did. We controlled for the level of cognitive deficit at those two levels of care and looked at how much problem behavior there is. There's five times more problem behavior in equally cognitively impaired people in the nursing home than people with the same cognitive deficits who live in a familiar uh, environment. Um, I, uh, I can't say that uh, there's not a selection bias here. For all you know, Morningside Manor puts people in the nursing home when they get their problem behavior. But I went back and reviewed uh, the last five years, everybody's charts who had been transferred, and only 12% were transferred because of behavior problems. What they use in Morningside to transfer people is not their behavior generally, but whether they can get to dinner on time, right? Whatever it takes for you to organize your behavior in such a way that at four o'clock with nobody else telling you what to do, you go to dinner, that's what it takes to stay at the residential level of care there. And when that goes, when you can't make it to dinner more than three times in a month, they send the nurse out to examine you and see if you need to stay there or need somewhere else. So in effect, that's a performance-based functional assessment. They were just simply saying, if you can do whatever it takes to get to dinner on time, then you're okay. And as soon as you can't do that anymore, we're gonna look at whether or not you need to be transferred. Okay. So people keep trying to go from the diagnosis, Alzheimer's disease, say, to problem behavior, but you can't get there. There are no behaviors that are the behaviors of Alzheimer's disease, right? The diagnosis, Alzheimer's disease, gives you an executive deficit, but what you actually do depends on your habits, which in turn are the product of your life story right because it's what you've done before in your life that determines which habits you have which are now released by your disease but still that won't tell you what somebody's going to do because you have to know their habits and then you have to know the environment that they're in it's the interplay between the environment their habits and executive deficits that produces problem behavior you can't predict the problem behavior of a demented person without knowing all of that So now, what are the signs of someone with executive deficits, regardless of their diagnosis? Frontal lobe brain damage produces really two syndromes. The first of these are the first syndrome, which is more apathy, loss of spontaneity, and stereotypy. Okay? They do things repetitively in a stereotyped way because their behavior is driven by the habits. The habits only know one way to do things. They're not flexible. So to the extent that the environment is, is similar, they'll do the same thing over and over and over. See, if the environment doesn't tell the habits to do anything, they won't do anything at all. So they just sit until you walk by. Having somebody walk up to you is a familiar cue. So they'll say, hello, hello, hello. And then as soon as you're out of range, that habit turns off, they go back to sitting. You come back the other direction two minutes later and they'll go, hello, 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 turn off again. They can keep that up all day long, right? A normal person would say, this person is ignoring me, they've been by 15 times, there's no reason for me to keep saying hello to them. See, but they're not normal. They've lost that higher understanding of how to behave. They react simply out of the cue. Okay, imitation behavior. It's built into you to, to imitate what you see going on around you. See, if you start clapping, the Alzheimer's patients will start clapping. Um, yes? That's another form of imitation, yeah, right. And these things are found across dementing illnesses. So a schizophrenic develops echolalia. That's where it was first described. But children are echolalic too. The frontal lobes are the last part of your brain to develop. Children are not born with them. The behavior of children resembles the behavior of, of Alzheimer's disease because children don't yet have what Alzheimer's patients are losing, executive functions. Uh, that's, so that's childishness, I skipped ahead here. Utilization behavior, objects tell them what to do with them. They'll utilize it. If they see a doorknob, they'll open it. If they see a comb, they'll put it in their hair. If they see a pencil, they'll start to write. If they see a purse, they'll open it. Think about that. The little old lady has a purse. She opens her purse, she sees things inside. The things inside elicit taking them out, sorting them. Okay, now the situation's different. Now she has an open purse with things all over the table. So she puts them back in the purse, closes it. Now she has a closed purse, so she opens it, takes everything out. 
Now she has an open purse, so she fills it back up and closes it. Now she has a closed purse, so she opens it up, takes everything out. There's no end to that cycle. She'll go through it over and over and over because it's the purse that drives the behavior, not her goals. She's not trying to get, find anything, remember where she put anything or anything else. She's engaging in this behavior, which came out of her habits. Uh, this leads to environmental dependency, so that the environment tells these people what to do. To the extent that the environment is familiar and normal, you'll get familiar normal behaviors. To the extent that the environment's not, you'll get bits and pieces of normal behavior that looks bad. Think about how that works. Many people with Alzheimer's disease develop it living in their own homes. Okay? Living in their own homes, their behavior is guided by cues that are familiar and associated with normal behavior so they can become quite demented while maintaining normal behavior so that the family doesn't notice anything's wrong. The first time they think anything's wrong is when they take her out of that environment and take her on vacation, a relative's house at Christmas, she falls and they take her to an inpatient unit, you switch the environment. In that environment, the same behavior is not normal. If she wakes up at her Aunt Josie's house in Colorado and wants to cook breakfast, it's not socially appropriate because guests don't cook. But she sees a kitchen, and that's what you do in a kitchen. And so the family first becomes aware that she has a problem. They bring her to the doctor. He says, oh my God, they got Alzheimer's disease. It's been like this for three years now. The family thinks it's a new problem. But if you go back, you can find traces of Alzheimer's disease for two or three years. So they take her and they put her in a nursing home, right? Because she has Alzheimer's disease. In the nursing home, her behavior falls apart because it's a completely, radically different environment that's not familiar to her at all. And so she looks like she falls apart right after they move her to the nursing home. But her habits can still be taught, right? The subcortex is still alive. It's not affected by Alzheimer's disease. So over a period of months, she reestablishes a new behavior pattern that's driven by the nursing home. It becomes familiar in that sense, and she starts behaving in a repetitive, stereotyped way in the nursing home and calms down. Her behavior looks, looks you know, less of a problem. What does he have? I'll bet you you said something that was on this list. This is the list of the, quote, reversible dementias. All of them can produce this behavior, right? If you talk to him, you might find out he was sad. You'd say, oh, he's depressed. But if you noticed he had a tremor, you might say he has Parkinson's disease. If you didn't know any of those things about him, just looking at him is a particular behavioral syndrome that comes in dementia. But not every dementia, these dementias. Isn't it interesting that none of the reversible dementias are on the list of cortical dementias? These are what are called subcortical dementias. In these dementias, the subcortex is affected. In these dementias, it's not. If the habits are chewed up by the disease, you don't have habits, so you quit behaving at all. You see, when the subcortex is affected by a disease, you don't get any behavior at all. They just sit. But when the cortex is destroyed, you get all sorts of behavior. It's all bizarre, strange things. We have a PIX patient, uh, a woman, right? She's a housewife. She goes to the restaurant and gets up and asks the other patrons if she can clean their plates. Right? She's driven, that's what she does at home. She gets up, walks over, oh, excuse me, you've got a little chicken, let me just take care of it. Right? We have another one who's a man. He goes to the restaurant and goes and plays the piano because he knows, he knows how to play the piano. He sees a piano up on the stage. He just walks over in the middle of dinner and starts playing the piano. Okay, so the signs of cortical dementias depend on the different functions that the uh, the disease is chewing up, but, but the things I want to show you is that they have normal movements, they're cheerful, they're engaging, and they're socially adroit. Okay, their habits keep them smiling and talking to you, and they shake your hand, and they pat you on the back, and they say, hello, how are you doing? But everything they say is gibberish, it's wrong. They've lost memory, language, constructions. They can't do things anymore, but they keep going through the movements. Their habits sustain them. They look superficially normal. The first Alzheimer's patient I ever saw, well, the first patient I ever saw as a medical student had Alzheimer's disease. 
I spent an hour with the woman, came out of the interview and said there's nothing wrong with her. Because you know, it never occurred to me to ask her why she was there, you know, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and she couldn't have told me anybody in her family, their names, their addresses, their phone numbers. But superficially, she smiles, she looks you in the eye, she says, well, I just, they just brought me here, right? But a subcortically demented person loses even that. They become just a lump sitting in a chair. It's hard to get them to do anything at all. And yet, if the cortex is spared, they may have the ability to do things. See, so a depressed patient won't remember things. But if you prompt them, if you say, well, it started with the letter A, they'll go, oh, Apple because the answer is in there. Their problem is getting it out. And in Alzheimer's disease, there's no answer. They, they can't remember the object. In depression, they can remember it, but they can't organize the effort of the, the task. You know, name those three things, they'll name one. They won't go to the next step. So uh, what this is saying is that for any level of executive problems, there's two behavioral syndromes. Okay, we developed another test called the qualitative evaluation of dementia that looks at dementia quality. This test tells you how demented they are and just want to show you that you can have a score of 40 out of 50 possible score, uh, points on the executive interview and be this quality as opposed to this one. This is Alzheimer's disease. This is multiple strokes or depression or Parkinson's disease. They behave differently. They're just as demented. So here, instead of giving you all the people, I just broke them down by diagnosis. This is Alzheimer's disease. As Alzheimer's disease gets worse, they get more and more disinhibited and uh, their, their, the quality of their behavior looks cortical. But if you have subcortical dementia, then the more executively impaired they get, the more subcortical they get. Oh, this guy up here, he has Pick's disease. He was listed as dementia with no cortical features because the only thing wrong with him is his frontal lobes. He has no memory or language or construction problems. He's normal, so there was no cortical findings. But his executive functions are cho totally destroyed. He has habits because it's not a subcortical disease, so he behaves like an Alzheimer's patient. But his memory scores are normal. His language is normal. If you didn't think about executive functions, you couldn't put your finger on what it was that was wrong with him. But he's clearly not normal. He behaves like an Alzheimer's patient. So executive deficits can divorce the capacity to do something from actually getting it done. Okay? We're tempted, we're often tempted, especially uh, lay people, caregivers, to blame the patient, to say they're not trying, they're not motivated, they're uh, lazy, they're, you know, whatever. That's usually not true. It's usually an executive problem. So that I, I'll get a neuropsychological report that says the patient was not very motivated, but uh, got correct answers when we prompted him. He just needed a little direction and he did fine. That's a subcortical dementia. On his own, he can't do anything. But if you tell him what to do next, he'll get it done. But you have to be his frontal lobes. You have to tell him what to do next. You have to keep after him. You have to stand there and say, do this, do that, do this, do that. They'll get it done. This means clinically that they perform below their apparent potential. They seem to lack motivation. They need prompting and they can improve their performance with direction. But they won't be able to sustain this on this, their own. If you leave the room, they go right back how they were. You can't teach them to do it on their own. This happened um, in some instances and in others. For instance, a person could get themselves dressed and go through some of those familiar moments, mm -hmm. but if they're asked to do a task that's not a, a normal habit, task, mm -hmm. something they, could right. do, they formally could do, but don't right. normally do every day, mm -hmm. that then they, they need prompting. Yeah, it de depends on uh, you know the specific diagnosis. What, what you can see is that they may perform something on their own in an environment that's familiar to them, but in a different context, they can't do it at all. See, so um, getting dressed might be a, a, a good example. If you put them in the bedroom and said, "Get dressed, we're going to go out," they might do it. But if you took them to the bathroom and said, "It's time to get dressed," they would just look lost because the bathroom is actually telling them to shave or to 
use the towel or something. Okay, so what can you do about this? First of all, you should establish a daily ritual. Anything that you do day after day after day becomes a habit, right? You don't have to practice it or you know, have them memorize it or anything. If you do it over and over and over, it will become a habit. It's part of your brain. That's how it works. Yeah, but it's the actually doing of it that creates a habit, not talking about it or thinking about it. You've got to just, just do it. So that to the extent that you simplify the patient's life and do the same thing every day over and over and over, they will start to live their life in that pattern, even if it's a pattern that they didn't used to have. Okay. Second thing, uh, well, so, it, so that gets to the second one, which is that you want to use the new routine to break up the old habits that are competing with it, the old habits that are making your life miserable or, or difficult, okay? So uh, uh, you have a caregiver. The third thing is that uh, well, you want to make sure that the, r the ritual that you engage in is something that the caregiver can live with, right? The caregiver may not be free to bathe the patient until after the breakfast dishes are put away, say. So that's 9.30, right? But the patient had a habit for taking his bath at night. So he will resist bathing during the day. He doesn't have habits to do that. So what she has to do is make sure that he, she never bathes him at night, always in the morning after the breakfast dishes are away in exactly the same order every day. Over time, he'll start to acquire the habit of bathing during the day. Suddenly, she doesn't have a problem anymore. Listen to what the environment says. If you want somebody to get bathed, you don't want to talk about it while they're watching TV, right? The TV room is eliciting TV watching behavior. The bedroom is listening something else. The kitchen is listening something else. You can't get them out of that to work on what it is you want them to work on. You have to set it up like a theater set in advance. All you do is you just take the patient by their hand. This is a cue that will elicit following you. You walk to the bathroom and you've already set out all of the shower and the shaving and everything else. And then just leave them there and they start to pick it up. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, the skills are getting chewed up too. So this really only works in the early to middle stages where the executive functions are mostly what's wrong. Later on, they'll forget even how to recognize or use a razor and then you have more of a problem. A subcortical dementia though, this will still work because they have the skill intact. What they're missing is the sequencing, the programming, the initiative, the getting it, getting it organized and started. Uh, use social cues, I told you about that. Um, I once had a patient who didn't want to get his blood drawn. So he's standing in the doorway going, I gotta get out of here, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Notice that that's stereotyped and repetitive, just like a, just like a habit driven behavior. So my residents are pulling and the person's uh, wife was pushing him into the room. Dad, come on dear, you gotta go get your blood drawn. That's what the doctor wants. What would you do? What habit would it elicit from you if people came up and pushed and pulled you? Right? That's a social cue. If people push you and pull you, you're going to resist. So by managing him that way, you elicit the very behavior that you want to get rid of. You see? So I just told him to back off. I took two steps into the room and I said, hello, even though I've spent the last hour with him. Right? I trigger a handshake. So he walks in, shakes my hand. Now I'm shaking his hand. My hand is the trigger. As long as I'm shaking, he won't let go because my hand makes him shake. He, when, if I shook anybody else's hand, you'd shake it twice till socially you decided it was inappropriate and then you'd take your hand away even if I left mine out. You see, socially we mutually decide that it takes three shakes and that's social and we pull it back. But this person doesn't have a frontal lobe, he can't do that. So my hand drives handshaking. So now I've got him handshaking. Handshaking is a pleasant experience. He's totally now off the track of resisting care and being aggressive. So we're just shaking hands. I say, what is that thing? It's a chair. The chair elicits sitting down behavior. So he just walks over, doesn't say a word, sits down in the chair. See? We had another uh, person who got the wrong pill in the nursing home. They gave him, you know, somebody else's medicine. So the nurses are going, spit it out, spit it out, spit it out, opening his mouth. Well, what would you do if people walked over and tried to open your mouth out? So the social worker who I'd been talking to a while just walked over and went, <laughs> he imitated the behavior, spit the pill out. You see, you can use these social cues to your advantage, but you have to know how they work and what your behavior in the context of caring for a demented person is likely to elicit. 
And you won't understand that unless you know more about their social history. We had another man, Alzheimer's disease. He, had a, a, he was a golfer. So he has a cane, right? They've given him a cane for his, uh, his gait. Now, because he got the cane after he was executively impaired, he never learned how to use it correctly because you can't teach him how to use a cane, right? To him, it's a golf club. His habit recognizes this stimulus as a golf club. So I said, you know, this guy's going to go to the nursing home. His behavior is going to fall apart in that context. He's going to make somebody mad. And one day, those habits will take that cane and go whop. So I recommended that they get rid of it and get a four-prong walker, which is a new stimulus he's never seen before and wouldn't remind him of a cane. So the nurses asked me, they got the dictation. They asked me about that. They said, now why did you recommend that? I mean, you know, uh, he seemed like he needed a cane. Why would you take that away from him? And I told him what I was thinking. And he said, oh, is that why? And they said he had been walking around with a cane like this, walking through the nursing home with his cane like this. You see? There's, it's his habit, his past experience as a golfer that predicted that he would use that sort of stimulus as a golf club. See? So you can start to anticipate what they're going to do under particular settings and try to remove those stimuli. Um, so anyway, uh, this is where I just wanted to leave this up to, to show you that we're involved really across several different sites and are doing uh, clinical Alzheimer's research in a variety of settings. So um, I can tell you more stories. I got a hundred stories, but I thought maybe y'all might want to ask me some questions about patients you've seen maybe and you might be able to use the model to figure out how you could approach it. Yes, sir. Is, is there a typical pattern on the rate at which these patients deteriorate, or is that all individual? Uh, I think uh, that depends a lot on the diagnosis, because you know the diagnosis dictates the natural history of the diseases. Uh, so simple, uncomplicated Alzheimer's progresses over years, and it's pretty constant. You're not if somebody fell apart in a week with Alzheimer's disease, I'd suspect they had a new problem, like a drug-induced delirium or a stroke or something added on top of it. Um, if somebody has fallen apart truly in less than a year, and uh, I can't, you know, families often say the patients have gotten worse in less than a year because they don't bring them to me till they get the executive problems and therefore the memory, I mean, the behavior difficulties. But I can find the history by kind of quizzing them going back two or three years, I feel much more comfortable it's Alzheimer's. But if absolutely, positively, this person fell apart in less than a year, I would really work them up thinking it was something else and look for other, other things. Yes, Actually, I see more um, injury mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, but a, a lot of frontal cortex right. injury. Do these same... Yeah, uh, I think uh, the same things same are... Techniques. Yeah, they ought to work in that. Yeah. The thing I want to point out... Unfortunately, a lot of the head, head, head injuries are self-induced, uh, botched. Uh-huh, yeah. So well, that kind of gets to the point. The, the, what this is saying is that at every level of executive problems, there are two different ways you can behave, right? I don't think that you behave based on what you've lost. Your behavior, after you have a frontal lobe lesion or executive deficit, is based on what you have left over, you see? In Alzheimer's disease, what's left over after you take the cortex away are the habits. So their behavior becomes disinhibited, environmentally driven, and habit driven. That would be similar to a young patient who had a pure frontal lobe lesion because their habits will be left intact, okay? But a subcortically demented person, after you get rid of their executive functions, they don't have the habits left over. So their behavior turns inward, becomes apathetic, not spontaneous, they kind of dry up, you see? So that a depressed person who tried to kill themselves, even though they were young, might become apathetic, much more apathetic after that lesion. The same person with the same lesion, the same age, who wasn't depressed, you know, who was in a car wreck, might become disinhibited, outgoing, and, and uh, kind of a, a, a psychopath. They, they basically, they're people have recognized from traumatic frontal lobe lesions two syndromes, one of which is called pseudo-depression, 
The other one is called pseudo-psychopathy. They, you know, 50-year-old starts shoplifting after his car wreck. Because, yeah, he, he likes it, he wants it, he just picks it up and takes it out. And there's nothing up there saying, it's not right to do that. Right? How many of you have had children? Right? You take your two-year-old to the grocery store and she comes out with a tube of toothpaste. Right? That's the same, same phenomenon. As a matter of fact, for the Alzheimer's, for this syndrome, you can really model their behavior on two-year-olds. Many caregivers have experience for taking care of a two- or three-year-old. And so you can use that to their advantage in taking care of a demented person. Because children will do the same things. Their brains are built in the same way that an Alzheimer's patient's brain is falling apart. So, as a matter of fact, when we created this test, I had a two-year-old and I made sure that she could take all of the pieces of it so that we would test them. And they score the same as Alzheimer's patients. So, you know, think about that. I told you to do a bed, I mean, a, uh, a ritual for an Alzheimer's patient. That's what the bedside story is. Do you see? You're pairing the behavior going to sleep with several cues that are exactly the same every day. You know, the apple juice, the story, the lights are low, the, uh, you know, whatever. Whatever you do in a row right before they go to sleep. So that those cues start to be able to drive the behavior sleeping. If you take the same child and put them in an environment like a, an adult's party or a restaurant, where those cues aren't available, they'll stay up all night. Their behavior is driven by the environment that they're in. Our behavior isn't. We can take it or leave it. If we put each of us in solitary confinement, we wouldn't become apathetic. We would get up and bang the bars. We'd decide what we wanted to do. We'd, you know, call our lawyer or something. If we put us in a loud, noisy environment like a bus station, we don't start singing and dancing. But a two-year-old and an Alzheimer's patient will because a loud, noisy environment will trigger different associations than a quiet, uh, calm environment. And you can use that to change their behavior. Um, children imitate what you do. Alzheimer's caregivers have trouble with the, the patient following them around, doing exactly what they do. They're in their hair all the time, right? That's exactly like a three-year-old following mother around the kitchen, getting up there and just messing with everything just as the mother is messing with things, right? It's exactly the same behavior. Um, another form of imitation, you talked about echolalia, that's one of them uh, where they repeat what you say. Another one is that they do, they have uh, what's called verbal intrusions. What they hear around them gets into their behavior. They can't censor it, they can't say it's not relevant to them. So that one of the items on our test here is uh, how many words can you think of in a minute that start with the letter A, right? So we were testing this out in Morningside in the spring. There are all sorts of birds chirping outside. So we said, okay, how many words can you think of that start with the letter A? And the lady goes, I don't know any birds that start with the letter A. Birds, letter A, chirp, chirping, uh, singing. Uh, you see, she's totally lost the track of what I wanted to talk about, and she's being influenced by what she hears. In another nursing home I worked in, they had a requirement from the state to turn all the patients every two hours. You know, they, So the nursing home, in order to fulfill its mandate, didn't really make the nurses do that. What it did instead was announce the time over the PA system so that all the nurses could go into the rooms and remember to turn everybody over, right? So what happens is, in the Alzheimer's units, everybody's just walking along till the PA says, time to turn, time to turn, and all of the Alzheimer's patients just go walking off this way. You see that, you see that in uh, other psychiatric populations, other kinds of dementia. In schizophrenia, I can interview somebody and they'll answer a question that somebody else asked out in the hallway. Or they'll answer a question that the TV just said. My two-year-old will do the same thing. If she's playing with her dolls and they say something on TV, she'll answer the question. When I was an intern once, having been slept deprived for three days, uh, I once waved back to a car commercial where the people waved at me. See, it's the same phenomenon across. When your executive functions are compromised by drugs, head injury, Alzheimer's disease, whatever, your behavior falls back into these two patterns. And which pattern you get depends on what's left over more than where the lesion was that took your executive function away. So anyway, um, what I think you ought to do is read these suggestions, which again, were completely independent of my talk here, and look for 
how this model would explain how they came up with these recommendations. Because many of the things they're suggesting are exactly the things that the model would uh, predict. Right? So, uh, you know, praise the person's actions whenever possible. Compliment a hairdo or their outfit. You're using a social cue. If you say, boy, that's a pretty dress, they're reading your facial expression and coming up with the social context that goes with that, which is going to be to feel nice and be happy. So you've elicited feeling happy. Whereas if they grab you and you yell at them because you're tired, then you will elicit the opposite. You'll elicit more, even worse, anger or something. I once had a, an Alzheimer's patient, uh, I was doing a neurology exam where you have to go, you know, touch my finger, now touch your nose, and I'm sticking my finger in his face. And that elicited, you know, he was frightened by it. So he grabbed my wrist like this. If I go, <gasps> you know, let go of that, he's going to break it. Because I, my reaction influences the way he behaves. So what I did was just relax totally, take out my pen and say, what is this thing? And he let go of my wrist and picked up the pen. He's not angry at me. There is no goal. He's not trying to keep me away from him or make me go away or anything like that. There is no goal behind that. My behavior triggered his response. My new behavior triggers the next response. And he can go from one to the other with no problem at all. That's exactly how you treat a temper tantrum in a two-year-old. Right? A two-year-old is getting into drawers, you know, opening the drawers, taking everything out, just like an Alzheimer's patient. So you say, don't do that, that's a mess. So they go, Aah! just like an Alzheimer's patient. Alzheimer's patients, we call that a catastrophic reaction. In children, we call it a temper tantrum. But it's the same phenomenon. So what do you do with the temper tantrum? You don't punish them. That'll make it worse. What you do is you say, what's the name of this thing? And it goes away like that. You distract them. The same phenomenon happens in Alzheimer's disease. And it's really related to how the brain is put together, not to the things you might want to label it.